It's great to be with you tonight. I've just come back from holiday in the center of the universe, that's over in Wales, so that Welsh air, there's nothing quite like it, so I come really inspired tonight with that sense of hoil um, and that real inspiration. There's lots of things really stirring on my heart tonight as we continue our series in Romans, which Tim helpfully introduced last week. It's a whole series we're doing uh, under the title Ultimate. Last week it was Ultimate Power, tonight it's Ultimate Consequences, and then we have uh, others, Ultimate Freedom and Ultimate Love. And we're looking at the kind of ultimate truths about God, about human nature, about society in our world. So we're particularly looking at Romans 2 and 3, and I'm going to invite Lindsay just to come and read a section from Romans 3. So if you're following it, it's Romans 3, verses 20 to 28, which will be our focus tonight. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of sin. But now a righteousness from God apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. Where then is boasting? It is excluded. On what principle? On that of observing the law? No, but on that of faith. For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from observing the law. Thank you, Lindsay. Romans can often seem quite a heavy book, rather meaty, but tonight as we unfold it together, I want to try and bring it alive to us and see how it's relevant to our lives today. But particularly the series we're doing, I'm just trying to see if I can pull out a copy of the evening, um, uh, there's a little program at the back which has got the, the series on if you want to get one as you go, it gives you the whole series on it, here we are. It's a little uh, square looking one like, um, like this. So do take one of those which gives you the whole series, there's also the update that gives you the whole of the morning and evening series. But as well as that, um, to help in following through on our Sunday evening series, uh, Philip has put together a helpful kind of some outlines to be able to use during the week, whether it's in home group, whether it's in pastor group, whether it's in personal Bible study, or just even a small prayer triplet. It's sort of a series of questions and sort of discussion starters. And what I'm going to do tonight in order to make the most of that and to illustrate a little bit of how we might use them, I'm going to take those four questions that come under tonight's as the outline for what I'm going to unfold. So it'll make it easy when you take it during the week. And if you've never done that in your group, try it out. It's just taking it off the web, you can, it prints off as an A4, looks something like that, and uh, it, with it will be the kind of series uh, of questions. So I'm going to take them and just try and unfold a little bit of it tonight because it gives us some amazing insights that are so relevant to our society today and to our lives. Maybe some of you here tonight, and you're here for the first time, maybe some of you are not yet Christians, you just explore it all, this passage of Scripture gives some remarkable insights. Maybe some of you here are Christians for years, but somehow you've lost something of the freshness, and it's become rather mundane, and this passage of Scripture will help bring a challenge as to the kind of values that we hold and what it really means to be a Christian. And even for those of you who are keen Christians, I trust you'll help to bring something of that radical edge. What happens in this passage is that Paul, he explains something of the ultimate consequences of living a life without God, but it also helps us as Christians to appreciate in a fuller way, you can never fully appreciate the good news, the gospel, until you realize the full extent of what we've been saved from. So it helps to unfold that, and I'm going to do it, taking it step by step as we expound this passage. The first, the first question which we'll look at 
In fact, in verse uh, 20, and it's the first in the outline, is taking verse 20, where verse 20 of Romans 3 says this, no one, no one ever, no one at all, will ever be declared righteous through observing God's law. No one will ever be declared righteous in God's sight purely through observing God's law. We want to ask the question, why not? And if not, then what's the point of the law? It's vital for us to understand that for the Christian faith and for so many people, they imagine that being a Christian is about a set of rules and regulations, a set of laws, as it were. You shouldn't do this, or you shouldn't do that, or you should do this, or you shouldn't do that. It's actually, what it's really about is a living relationship with Jesus lived in the power of the Holy Spirit. But here's where the challenge comes, because rightly someone might argue and say, wait a minute, Rob. Surely being a Christian is about knowing what's right and what's wrong. It is about living a righteous life. It is about having moral values. So don't say, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, just a, it's just about a relationship with God. Surely it is about God's law, God's values, God's ways. And that's true. But those are the fruits, not the roots of our Christian life. They're the outcome, not the source. It is important that as Christians we understand those values of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, those godly, righteous way of living. But it's not that that makes us a Christian. It's not because I live or try to live a righteous life and do what's right that that's what makes me a Christian. That's the outcome of being a Christian. Now you may then argue, well, if that's the case, well, what's the point of the law? Why has God given us the law? And here it's important to understand, particularly in a society in which we live, the value of the law, the law of God, that it does help us to understand what's right and what's wrong. And it goes on there for in verse 20, the next section to say is that it's through the law that we become conscious of sin, of what's right and wrong. One of the pictures that the Bible uses in, in the book of James is that the, the law of God, the word of God, the Bible, in its revelation of what's right and what's wrong, the way we should live our lives and the values we should hold, it's like a mirror. And when you look into that mirror, you begin to see what's real about your life. Now, sometimes you may have been, I don't know, working on the car or something, and uh, you've got a great big oily smudge down your face and uh, you come to the end of the day and you finish working on the car and you're about to go out for the evening and so you you wash your hands you put on your gear but you don't realize you've got this great big oil stain right down the, your face there and as you go out and you meet somebody on the bus stop they, they look a little bit funny at you and you're not quite sure is there something wrong with me but you can't see it yourself you see because it's on your face you know uh, and then you see somebody else and they look a little bit strange you as well but they, they, they feel a bit rude to say to you what's that oily stain on your face and so so no, no one quite says about it and you, you live your life almost and you could go on. It's a bit like this in life sometimes, that um, we need something objective. We need to be able to look and be able to see objectively life and value. The Word of God is like a mirror, James says. You look into it and you see those righteous values. It helps us to see what's wrong and what's right. And Now, the challenge is that the law can do that. So the value of God's word often is helping us to see what's right and what's wrong. But what the law can't do is then put it right. So I can't then take the mirror off the wall, and I now, I've seen this oil smudge down my face, think, goodness me, and I take the mirror off the wall and begin rubbing the mirror around my face because the mirror can't put it right. He can only show me what's wrong. And that's key to understanding the place of Scripture and the way in which we handle Scripture. Because while Scripture can help us to see objectively, it can point out those values of what's right and wrong, it's not as if it just now obedience to those laws, now we'll put it right. In fact, we've got to reach for the soap and water. There's another means, which we'll see in a moment, is the means of God's grace and forgiveness that brings that. And so the first questions we want to explore together is that whole thing about law and the place of God's law in our lives. The second question develops on from it and takes based on verse um, 23 of Romans 3 we've just read together. And it says this amazing statement that all, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
I want to dwell on this a little bit because it, it gives us some amazing insights into issues that we face today in our lives, in our workplace, in our homes, in our families. When you say all have sinned, Rob, you don't mean everyone. Do you mean everyone in church who's realized it? No, 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 everyone, everyone. Well, everyone, you mean the queen, the pope, everyone, everyone. But if everyone has, then why is it so difficult for us to talk about sin? Why is it so hard for people to understand there's something wrong? If it's not just a, a sort of a germ you catch in church, but it's something that everybody, everybody's in. Why is it so hard to talk about it? And here are some important insights and understanding about, because in terms of how we perceive values, what's right, what's wrong, and moral values, there is a whole battle going on for our minds and for our understanding, a battle of good and evil. And often there can be whole mindsets whereby people just can't get it, can't perceive it. And one of the key things often is in this understanding of, of right and wrong. We live increasing in a society which is what we would call it's, it's, it lives with relativism, that everything is relative. By that we mean there are no absolute values. You can't say that's right and that's wrong. It may be right to you and wrong to you, but it may not be right to me or wrong to me. Or it may have been wrong 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but it, it, it's changed. The society has changed. It'd be old-fashioned to think of that as wrong now. So everything is relative and changing. I remember some years ago uh, an interview uh, on television with two uh, television producers of two of the most famous at that time soaps that were running these sort of weekly series of uh, they're meant to be, you know, whether it's like Coronation Street, etc. This is meant to be normal life, if you can imagine anyway, but it's meant to be normal life, you know, kind of in a particular family or group of people. And uh, when they're being interviewed, they say, but um, how, how do you manage sometimes with when you're, you're kind of on the threshold of some of the values in society? And one of the producers says this interview statement, he said, you know, what we have found is that if we cross a threshold in terms of the conscious of society, the awareness of what people think is wrong, it may be to do with, I don't know, with nakedness or with language we use or with practices, he says, what we'll find is we'll get a bag load of post for the next two weeks. He said, but provided we continue in the seas to show it as if it's normal, as if it's just generally accepted practice, he says, within two months, we have acclimatized the conscience of a viewing public that no longer is shocked by it. Because the shock was linked, initially we see, goodness me, but once it presumes now that that happens in a family, that's normal, that is, everybody accepts it, then before long, we have changed the threshold of acceptance. And values become relative. So you say, what young woman, true story, she just started work, it was some time ago, she started working in an office, seven of them in an open office it was. After a few months in this office, she got to know um, one of the managers, uh, um, an older man in the in the company, but they really got on well together and had lots of things in common and interests and seemed to really understand each other. He was a married man with a lovely wife and some children, but she was beginning to have feelings for him and he for her, and they were on that kind of threshold of, goodness me, what's happening with this? And a conversation was struck up with her, and this was the question. Tell me, do you think, do you think it's okay to have an affair with a, a married man if you really feel you're drawn to each other and there's something there of a chemistry in it? And here was her answer without hardly thinking. You might have thought she'd think together, goodness me, what's right, what's wrong, it's okay. But her answer was this. She said, well, actually, do you know, in this office of seven people, in this open office, there are four people who've all had affairs with other people. But that wasn't the question. But that's the answer. It's relative to what's acceptable. It's relative to what the norm is. And so constantly in society, our values are being shaped by society around us. Before long, we find the thresholds of what you might have been shocked by or not accept. Before long, those values can change. It happens almost imperceptibly at times. You begin to, to accept norms, as it were, in society. And this brings real challenges. Because in a democratic society, our social norms are in fact come through legislation of parliament, etc., and therefore we begin to develop those social norms. Imagine the story of a country where in fact they have a speed limit, okay? It's of 30 miles an hour in built-up areas. That's the speed limit. 
Now, some bright spark in the police service who does these statistics every year, realizing that, in fact, there's some areas of the countries where there's really high increasing speed breaking and speed offenses. And in fact, the, the list of fines and for some even um, custodian sentences linked with it was, was really growing and they had to do something about it. So here was the amazing discovery what they did. They decided that they would just increase the speed limit to 40 miles an hour. Do you know what happened? Suddenly they halved. They halved the number of speeding offenses. They halved the number of speeding fines. They halved it. But what happened was the consequences. The number of road deaths and accidents and injuries multiplied. And sometimes what happens in society is that we change the norms, the threshold, but we don't always recognize the ultimate consequences. Our lives and behavior and relationships have consequences. And how then, because this brings huge challenges, really relevant challenges today. If our public social norms are set by a democratic society in which therefore what the majority of people accept as norm is therefore agreed as social norm and that becomes public life. So literally today, or at least tomorrow, and these next few weeks in European courts at the moment are several cases going through the European courts, which is a question of where personal conscience of people in public service has come into conflict with publicly accepted norms. Because as that threshold has changed, how do we handle that? I've been interesting part of discussions this week in a group with the whole challenge of that, of when personal conscience begins increasingly to find a diversion from what may be becoming acceptable norms of that threshold changes. Now, it's not all bad news like that, because one of the challenges for us as Christians in, in that whole question is how do we challenge that conscience of society and the ways in which we do it? Uh, how do we not try and be the conscience of society or in that judgmental way, but how do we, in the way we live and the way we practice, how do we challenge society so we also are seeing changes in society? So over those hundred years, the last hundred years, while we have seen some of those thresholds change this way or this way, we've also changed, seen other changes. We've seen change in social conscience. So now slavery is no longer acceptable. We've seen other social evils that now have become unacceptable in society. So we need to constantly be challenging society. It's not just about personal morality, but about corporate morality, about global issues and the whole challenges that come in that area. So how then, what, what is our measure, our marker? What is our threshold? Is it just a moving thing? Is it just dependent on the group of people we live with or the society we're in? Listen again to those words of Romans 3 and verse 23, because it gives us a remarkable insight. Again, all have sinned and come short of the socially acceptable norm of their day. No. The legislative order of their society. No. All have sinned because they have come short of the glory of God. That there are absolute values. That what the Bible does to us, it gives us a revelation of who God is, a character and nature, his holiness, and those values that reflect. So then when God creates man, he creates us in his image to reflect that glory. And what we have fallen short of is that glory. So there are some absolute values. So the other picture the Bible uses, as well as a mirror, we look in and see what's wrong. In, uh, in the minor prophecy of this lovely picture where God used a picture of a plumb line. And a plumb line is meant to measure in an absolute way. So you're building a wall. And as you build this wall, you say to your mate, how's that doing? He says, oh, that looks crooked to me. How do you think? No, it looks okay to me. And what do you think? Well, he's standing on a slope. He thinks it doesn't look too slopey to me. But you know, it's all relative to how we're standing, how we're looking at it. And so it's all just... Then I take a plumb line. I put the plumb line against it. And the plumb line shows me where it's out of true. And so God has given to us a plumb line. There are absolute values. That's why we're talking in this series about ultimate values, about ultimate truth about God, about human nature, about society. And how do we bring that plumb line to our lives? And how do we challenge the conscience of society in the light of those values? Now here it goes further, and it's fascinating to see, because this passage gives some remarkable, helpful um, ways in which we, we perceive our society. Because the, the third of the questions we're going to look at 
is a kind of question then in the light of that in the light of the fact that uh, you know this is how society perceives things how how is that righteousness how does that righteousness from god come how do we really see that righteousness that comes from god how do we communicate that to a world around us you see sometimes the challenge is that we need to see how law and grace go together. If we end up with a, a kind of faith that's all about religious law and legalism, we end up putting people off. But if for us grace is just a careless way of meaning you can do anything, then equally we lose something of that real glory of God and those ultimate values. So to see how law and grace work together. But this is challenging in our society because the society in which we live finds it very difficult, the very nature of that battle of good and evil, those mindsets which easily shape the mind and conscience of society. It's almost the thinking in our modern and postmodern world is one of rational reduction in which, therefore, in a sense, to talk about right and wrong is almost is difficult because people don't want to feel bad about themselves. The whole of society is to create a good feel factor, is to, you know, to make the best of life, to look on the bright side of life. The word guilty is a dirty word. It's a word we shouldn't use. I mean, don't say guilty. And people, you get people feeling bad about themselves. You get, you get folk being depressed. You get, you get before long folk feeling demotivated. I mean, guilt is a really negative thing. Before long, we end up with what I would call uh, excuse and explanation rather than conviction and confession. In other words, we, we end up with trying to explain things that excuse things. And we avoid almost a sense of a willingness to admit there's something wrong. Now, we could take you to the extreme where the ridiculous thing would be that you go to your, your sense of... I, I never go to the doctor. Why do you never go to the doctor? Well, because he always tells me what's wrong with me. You know, he tells me what's bad. And he says, but isn't that why you're going to the doctor? But you don't go to the doctor just to diagnose what's wrong. You go to the doctor in order to find out what's wrong, in order to find a cure, to find an answer. But unless you're willing to recognize this, you say, well, I never go to the doctor. And there's some people who do that. Some people will never go to the doctor just in case he finds something wrong. So you just live and bury your head in the sand. You'd pretend there's nothing wrong. It's how... Is it then that we can find the grace of God in such a way that we're willing to recognize what's wrong? We're willing even to experience the pain of that conviction, which leads to confession and to faith. There's something wonderful about that process. This is the grace of God. It makes all the difference to our lives. You see, Sometimes it's like the smudge of oil on the face. You can explain it and excuse it. So if somebody says to you, hey, do you realize you've got a smudge of oil right on your face? You say, well, of course I have. I've been working on the car all day. You get dirty doing things like you. You just can't help it, man. Don't, don't keep talking about it. You make me feeling bad about it for long. I can live with it, man. You know, make the most of life. Take look at the good side of life. Don't, 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 don't dwell on those things. Let's just get on with life. You could do. And many folk that do that. So we have life. It's just that we, 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 we don't sort of somehow, we're not willing to take responsibility for consequences. We're not willing to admit it and face those consequences. You say, but Rob, surely you can understand that it's about a feel-good factor in life, about feeling free. It's about somehow, you know, that sort of sense in which, why, why do you want to feel bad about things and guilty about things? Why do you want to, and I, I've seen this argument at times, it seems so persuasive. But is ultimately living with a smudge of oil down your face, just explaining away? What about if there was someone who could come to you and say, hey, Rob, here's a hot bath. I've run it for you. It's free. There's even, you know, bath bubbles and that. And be able to actually recognize there's something wrong. Get in that bath. Experience something of the wonder of that forgiveness, the grace of God. It's like having a bath inside. You know, when you get out of a bath and you feel that sense of freedom. This is freedom. This is a real sense of freshness. This is real liberty. We used to sing a little song years ago. I get so excited, Lord, every time I realize I'm forgiven. 
There's a pain threshold that I go through. It's willing to admit. It's willing to confess. It's willing to repent. But it doesn't end there. It's the faith that changes that experience, that faith in the grace of God, that unmerited love of God that makes the difference. And this is the whole picture. And this is what Romans then unfolds. Come to those next section of verse 24 and 25, that you are freely justified by his grace. Here's real freedom. It's about the grace of God, the wonder of that grace that brings that freedom to our lives. And the fourth of the questions just asks again, and you get it coming in again in verse 25 about the sacrifice of Jesus and that blood of Jesus that brings with it cleansing forgiveness. And it says that this is how God's justice is demonstrated. How can that be justice? To see the innocent go through such suffering and anguish as Jesus did. To see such suffering on the cross. And yet somehow through that sacrifice, God has demonstrated his justice. If we were to face the consequences of our own sin. And by sin, we're not just talking about those occasional failures or faults. Sometimes it's that whole ingrained nature, selfishness and pride and vanity, so much a part of human nature. For some, it's even more endemic than that, where you know, it's a kind of mindset that are... There are habits and life-controlling things that somehow we feel could never change, could never break. It's like a scratch record where ever you get to that situation, it goes into the groove and the same thing of habits in our lives. Do we just have to settle for it, make the most of it, live with it, try and feel good about it? Or can it change? Can it completely change? Is it possible to have a bath inside as if the past is completely forgiven. Sometimes we take that word justified, and that's what verse, as verse 25 says, you are freely justified. To be justified, what does that mean? It means it's just as if I'd never sinned. To be justified before God is just as if I'd never sinned. Wow. Such is the amazing grace of God. It makes it possible for you and I to know experience of forgiveness is far beyond anything. No matter how good a life we try to live, no matter how much merit there was, so that nothing could ever wipe the slate clean. But such is the grace of God, the wonder of that grace in that sacrifice of Jesus. And the Holy Spirit brings that alive to us. It's not something, and this is a challenge sometimes when you have some of those conversations with a workmate or a colleague or a neighbor, and sometimes you can feel as if you're, you're knocking your head against a brick wall. There seems to be a different perception because often it's like with Jesus, with the disciples, when who do men say that I am? And eventually Peter says, you're the Christ, and Jesus says, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And part of the work of the Holy Spirit, you see, if conviction, if guilt is such a dirty word, if conviction is something we avoid at all costs, but the work of the Holy Spirit in the world, it's not just in the church, but out there tonight, Monday morning in your office, the person you think is the last person in the world you could ever talk about God, you should see the pornography he reads or the conversation he had. But let me tell you, God by his Spirit can be at work convicting that person. And Jesus said when he comes, the Holy Spirit, he will convict the world, he will convict that's making an awareness, what's wrong, of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. It's that work of the Holy Spirit to bring conviction. But it's also the work of the Holy Spirit to make real that grace of God. So he's at work both through the law in making that sense of an awareness of sin, but he's then at work also in making real the grace of God. It's the Holy Spirit who brings that all alive to us. It's he who makes that real to us. It's by grace that we're saved through faith. Even that, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God in the capacity to believe. It's something God has given to us. By faith as we respond, the Holy Spirit brings that alive to us. One of the things you're encouraging even this week, and part of those notes is to just uh, encourage opportunities to be able to pray. Take a few moments of quiet where maybe things in your life that you've just taken for granted, you've not taken seriously. You've set your values, your threshold just by people around you. But somehow in the light of God's glory, that revelation of who Jesus is and the holiness of God, 
You know, in Scripture it says, be holy because I am holy, says the Lord. Those are those ultimate values. Sometimes we need to know something of that highway of holiness, that path of holiness, where somehow the plumb line drops and we look and sense, goodness me. Sometimes we're almost afraid to let that happen. We want to challenge each other at times just to take those opportunities, not in order that we just end up feeling bad about it and guilty about it, but in order that we may experience the grace of God. For we never sometimes fully experience the ext full extent of the grace of God because we don't fully allow ourselves to realize the ultimate consequences of things that are going on in our lives. For some, it may be life-controlling things that no one else knows about. We want this week just to encourage that sense of openness for the Holy Spirit to be convicting in order to bring that sense of life. We also want an opportunity to be able to pray for one another, to encourage just that fresh awareness of the grace of God. Freely we receive it. Sometimes for some people it's just that sense of needing to, to let go and to let God, let the grace of God flow, to experience the wonder of that grace. No matter how deep you sunk, no matter how dark things may have been in your life, the grace of God. That amazing wonder of God's grace. As Corrie ten Boone often quote, no pit is so deep that God's grace is not deeper. However deep the pit is you may feel you're in, the grace of God is the wonder of that. For us also to be praying for one another for opportunities to share something of that good news and the fresh appreciation of it. You know, yesterday morning, my neighbor knocked on the door. He's a new neighbor. He's been in about six months, and uh, I invited him. It was Saturday morning. I said, we've got time for a coffee. He said, yes. Yeah. So he came in and sat down. He knows I'm a Christian. We've had a few conversations, and I've had a chance of helping him in different things. So we've got a good relationship. And we're talking together a little while, and he said, Rob, he says, do you know sometimes I struggle? He's lived a fairly checkered life. He says, you know, I struggle sometimes in knowing what's right and what's wrong. I've got some mates, and when I'm with them, I think, oh, this is okay. And then uh, when I'm with these other folks, I feel, oh, goodness me, that's wrong. He says, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you know what's right and what's wrong? I looked at him with a smile. <laughs> I said, you know, for me, the Bible is a source of revelation. It's something that God has given to us. In fact, you know, tomorrow evening, I'm going to be speaking about this. So I gave him a little pricey of this sermon. This is my name, and I'm just sat with him. I said, you know, he said, but, but I find it difficult to understand the Bible. And I said, uh, how does it, he said, but you know, often I'll call him Chris. Chris, the Bible can be like a mirror. You look in it. When you look in it, you begin to see how life really is and yourself in it. He said, I never thought of it like that. I said, but the wonderful thing is, it's not just, he said, but if, he said, I'm frightened sometimes because, just like we were saying earlier, you know, there's so many things in my life that I've messed up in that if I begin to dig too deep, I'll feel really bad about it all. I said, but here's the wonderful truth of the gospel is, it's, the, it's a story of God's love and mercy, that God longs to be able to forgive and to cleanse us. Well, he said, even me? I said, yeah, even you. He said, how could I know more about that? Well, that was my clue for Alpha. I said, you know, 10th of October, a few weeks' time, and I'm hoping he'll be there. In fact, he's going to bring his son with him, hopefully, to the Alpha. Just, it's an opportunity. I just explained to him as a kind of course he run to just explain those basic steps of what it means to become a Christian, exploring the whole meaning of life, some of those ultimate questions of life, those ultimate truths about life. Every day of our life, we touch on other people, people who are lost, without God and without hope. And it's only sometimes when we realize the ultimate consequences, a person living their life without God, that it can become a real motivation to want to share that good news. If we get easily, as it were, hoodwinked into that sense of relativism, where in the end of the day we just rashly reduce it all and think, well, they're not so bad after all, we end up as if some... But it's when we realize the eternal consequences that it stirs in us a sense of motivation to want to share that good news. But in order to share the wholeness of that good news, we have to appreciate the full extent of what we've been saved from, the consequences that that grace of God has saved us from. When we do that, it somehow brings a sense of excitement about wanting to share that. When we feel excited about how much we've been forgiven, somehow there's something contagious about sharing that good news. Here's a little glimpse of it in Romans 3, verses 20 to 28. This week, study it for yourself in your small group, in your pastorate. Reflect on it. If you're not meeting this week in small group, then even just yourself, 
give a little chance to reflect on that. As I came in, or someone coming in tonight, I was welcoming the door. He said, Rob, have you got any notes for tonight? He said, we don't always do notes on Sunday evening, but especially for tonight, we've got it on the web. So if you go onto the web and look up there under those ultimate series, you'll see a set of notes linked with the outline I've done tonight. Use it. Maybe you've never done a serious Bible study yourself. Just use it for a personal Bible study. But above all, we want to sense is God's Holy Spirit bring alive to us afresh this truth, this ultimate truth about God, about human nature, about a society in which we live. Let's pray together. Let's stand as we pray. And I'm going to get Tim then just to come and lead us as we close. Heavenly Father, it's so easy in a society in which we live to find that incrementally and subtly our own values are changing. What we once felt we would never do or never say, we find ourselves doing and saying. We justify it because around us we find everyone else is doing it. Before long, Lord, we have changed the speed limit, as it were. But we've not changed the consequences the ultimate consequences. For our society, we want to constantly be challenging the conscience of society. We want to do it in a way that just doesn't come over as judgmental, but helps to bring law and grace together so that it's true freedom, that true liberty of sins forgiven and peace with God. Come now by your Spirit. Bring these truths alive to us afresh tonight so with a renewed confidence we can share our faith. Lord, I pray that even this week, maybe a friend or a neighbor or colleague that we could invite to this next Alpha. Give us an opportunity, Lord, to share our faith with a new confidence in Jesus' name. Amen.